The tech is live. I hope I uh, know what I'm doing right now. I've got all my buttons changed on my uh, my switcher thing because I switched over to the mouse window. I switched to mouse for all the configurations. So yeah, what's going on, everybody? Wendell, how's it going over there? That didn't work. There, that worked. Aspirated grunt. <laughs> so um, I guess we should go ahead. I'm going to wait for a few more people to show up, maybe like two. You know what? I don't care. Let's go ahead and start talking about Leonard Nimoy. Um, 93, or no, 83, almost in 93. Uh, he, he did live long and he did prosper. So a little moment of silence for, uh, for Leonard Nimoy here. Wait, are you sure you're streaming? Should be. Yep. It, it's a, about a minute the, and a half delay. I've reloaded the page as an anonymous user and it says nine minutes and 40 seconds. Please stand by. It'll, it'll be there. It'll show up in a second. It's, um, it takes forever to, to, you know, show up. It's, we're there. Okay. Anyway, moment of uh, moment of silence for Leonard Nimoy. Just a few more seconds of silence, just so I can make sure we're streaming now. Oh, we're not. They're not receiving data for our from our encoder. Oh, nope. We're live. <laughs> we are live. Yes. YouTube is being funny right now. It was like. We're not receiving data, but now it says we're receiving data. We've been live for eight seconds. Anyway, we'll start over there just to make sure. So uh, what's up, everybody? We're going to do this live because, yeah, beer check, everybody. I'm drinking Hop Nosh. That's not even here nor there at this point. But uh, there, we're live. There's Wendell's face. All right. Yeah, rough start as usual. we got to get this whole starting on YouTube thing down. They don't make it very smooth uh, for transitioning to live. It just it's kind of weird. Anyway, um, Leonard Nimoy, he did live long and he did prosper, 83 years old. Uh, he did a lot more than just Star Trek, a, a lot more. But first off, let's take uh, just a moment here to, um, you know, remember and uh, and uh, remember Leonard Nimoy. Take a little moment of si silence there, everybody. So we're remembering him because he, uh, he contrib contributed a lot to the science world. Uh, he was an enthusiast for things technology, but he also was an artist. And he had his whole entire artistic side, which was interesting. And, uh, you know, he just he just really did give a lot back to the world, and especially to nerddom, more so than geekdom, but also geekdom as a whole. So, yeah. Wendell, what were some of your uh, favorite Leonard Nimoy moments? The Ballad of Bilbo Baggins, of course. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, no, you're not on. Let me turn on your screen. Audio and my disembodied voice. Being a disembodied there we are. voice is cool. I like being a disembodied voice. <laughs> yes, indeed. No this is, um. So I told you he did more than Star Trek. Oh. Um, there was, uh, I think, uh, Othello? <laughs> it was Othello. He, he, there was a. Like, he's in Othello, like, on. Broadway, and it's like, wow, the guy can act. Yeah, he was a very good actor. I mean, I don't think people give him enough credit for Spock because Spock was, you could almost be anything and um, and still have gotten away with it because it was a new race. You know, it was sci-fi. Uh, good acting was not really expected in sci-fi. It was more about the stories and the themes and, and all that sort of thing. But he created a character, and he did more than just act in that. He also contributed a lot to the lore um, of, of Vulcans and also just the lore of his character. He's the one who came up with the greeting of Live Long and Prosper. And uh, you guys can go online and Google how that happened. But I believe it had something to do with a Jewish ceremony that he witnessed. And they were all doing this. This is the symbol for the first letter in the word Shalom. And um, I, I guess when you're doing this, you're blessing someone. So people run around the country blessing each other and not even knowing that they're doing like a, a Jewish blessing there. But that's what he came up with for, uh, you know, a greeting between the Vulcans because he's like, listen, humans have handshakes. They do head nods. They, they do this kind of stuff. And Vulcans will have different mannerisms and they should develop some of those. So he developed this, told the director and the director's like, yeah, just do it. Just whatever, do it. And then the next thing you know, everybody on the street is walking around and, you know, every time they see Leonard Nimoy across the street, they're like, hey, and they do this to him. So... Yeah, pretty interesting uh, story there. I guess I'll tell you uh, my favorite. Oh, go ahead. Well, I think uh, I think when he was um, on the set of the original Star Trek, you know, he was aloof with the rest of the cast and you know sort of hung out in his trailer. 
but you know that's method acting it's like let's not be overly friendly and overly chummy with all the other actors so Neat. yeah here's uh one of my favorite moments with uh with spock here i i I don't really like the song Row, Row, Row Your Boat or anything like that, but um, I like this human element that they added into Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. You know, in the beginning of the movie, he wasn't really... They were trying to play, you know, sing some campfire song, and he wasn't really getting it, and toward the end, he has this, uh, you know, strangely cold but human moment. Their, their, their charisma together, all three of them, was, was really nice. But, yeah, you guys can research that, and I, I wouldn't mind knowing... What your favorite uh, out there, everybody in the audience? What, what your favorite m moments were with, um, you know, with Leonard Nimoy? All right, Wendell, shall we uh, go ahead and get down to the news? News. Let's do that. A week has passed and there's news. What? No, say it ain't so. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, you know, I just want to like hang out and go watch some some Leonard Nimoy stuff. Maybe I kind of I kind of want to catch up on the non Star Trek stuff right now. That'd be a good thing. Everyone in the comments, let me know what your favorite non-Star Trek role uh, for Leonard Nimoy was. Because I've seen a lot of the Star Trek and some of the other stuff, but but not enough. All right. Let's move on here. Uh, there's a very interesting article here, actually written by someone on uh, named Gil Gilgamesh on Reddit. But it's a, it's a few bullet points. I don't think he covers everything here. But it's a quick way to sum up what has happened now that we have um, Title II reclassification of the Internet Services Everyone is screaming, net neutrality is here. And um, yeah, it might be. We haven't seen the full rule set yet. But after we see the full rule set, we'll really know more, um, you know, about what all this means. So, I don't know. Wendell, uh, you got any takeaways from, you know, the recent net neutrality news from the FCC? Oh, so much craziness. Now, I think there was some episode of The Tech where I promised that I would eat my hat if this came to pass. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> you're gonna have to eat the hat and the beard <laughs> probably that's what it's looking like uh, that's the whole thing i just don't even know you you bastards at the fcc i just don't even know what's happening now so there were some surprising things with this like okay so net neutrality the whole forbearance thing that we've talked about all that yes that's good on the one hand now there are a lot of people that are coming out and saying Oh, because the redefining broadband is 25 meg, that means that ISPs, you know, small ISPs can't compete, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, 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 no. Just because they're saying 25 meg is broadband doesn't mean the small ISPs have to stop selling whatever it is that they're selling. It just means that they, they should sell it, they should sell faster services if they want to call it broadband. They can call it high speed, they can call it DSL, because it is DSL most, most of the time, but, you know, they can't call it, they can't necessarily call it high speed. Uh, the other surprising thing with this is this applies to mobile networks, which is huge in my opinion, because mobile networks have basically been able to do whatever the hell they want and no one cares. And so Sprint, Verizon, 18, every single wireless carrier that there is screws with the traffic, and now they're not allowed to do that. So that's huge. That's beyond huge, because a lot of the mobile carriers started to want to do their own radio services and their own TV services. We covered uh, Sprint or T-Mobile one, I think. Uh, was doing streaming radio and yeah. now well, you should be able to use streaming radio with any service that you want not just like if you pay the five bucks a month and you want to do streaming spotify data is data you could do that you know we got we got yelled at about the whole t-mobile thing because t-mobile they they were i think in their minds they were being the good guy because they were saying like hey any any streaming service that that wants free bandwidth just just needs to like let us know hey we are a streaming service and we will make it happen for them so they were trying to be relaxed and groovy but our bottom line is and that's still a prioritization of one service over another or one type of data over another it's all data out there and any prioritization is a step in the wrong direction even if it seems cool we need to not be comfortable and happy with the whole data bandwidth caps and that brings me to the next thing I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not sure if you've read everything yet. I I certainly have not, and I'm going to get more into it. And I know that the final rules have not even been presented yet. So there's already the conspiracy yes. theorists out there going like, "Well, we haven't even seen the final rules yet, man." The the <laughs> rules could be that Comcast gets to buy Time Warner, and that all of our data bandwidth caps are going to be 250, and that's considered reasonable. Dude, I don't know. So I think we need to be a little patient until we see the rules. It's not that they're going to withhold them. It's, this is not the secret courts, you know, that the NSA has where they can just throw someone in a box for the rest of their life because they don't like the way their beard looks. This is a bit different than that. 
So until we see the final rules, I'm going to withhold comment and keep my conspiracy theories to myself, even though I don't really have any in this at this time. But the one thing I have not explicitly seen, they talked about paid prioritization. Of course, there's going to be no more fast lanes, no more paid prioritization. Uh, they've talked about, um, well, the, the other big thing is that all the different carriers, everyone, anyone who wants to run lines, they're all going to have access to the conduits and the poles and all that sort of thing. So it's going to be way cheaper for like Google to run fiber, local municipalities to do things. That's another thing they did on, uh, in addition to all this. They removed um, any states who said, you know, like, hey, well, you, you, all the local municipalities and all the small internet providers must stop. The only people who can, you know, provide internet are Comcast and everything. And the local municipalities are not allowed to further their, you know, uh, expansion. So Obama was like, hey, can we fix that? And the FCC was like, yeah. So they they took took down all those rules uh, at a national level. Now, the you know, the states are not allowed to govern, uh, you know, the, the growth of the municipal or, or even stifle the municipal uh, broadband and all that sort of thing. But the one thing we're finally getting to it, the one thing that I have not seen specifically addressed is data bandwidth caps. I've seen everything else. Um, have you seen anything, Wendell, that, that says yes or no for data bandwidth caps? No, and the reality is that uh, as like if the caps are implemented fairly, this will totally not make any difference for caps one way or the other. If Comcast says 250 gigabytes is it, 250 gigabytes is it, and that would be considered fair and fine under these rules. But they would not be able to say what the 250 gigabytes was. They, they couldn't go to Netflix and say, hey, your Netflix traffic doesn't count against that, or hey, this other traffic doesn't count against that. They would have to, if they were going to do that, they would have to make all video traffic from all video providers have the same protection equally. So, Yeah, I, I'm still not too keen on the idea of there not being any solid rules against data bandwidth caps. But... Um, there is kind of a thing in there that is uh, the FCC has the power to investigate network management practices. So that's something, I think. That means that the FCC is going to have this this whole, uh, the, the Netflix thing with the peering, the FCC really had a hard time getting solid figures on that. And so, like, um, let's call them uh, defectors or leakers or people that work internally at Comcast send us all sorts of delicious, interesting information about uh, the network management policies, which were basically like, let's uh, load the Netflix IP addresses on the Cisco access list called Suck It Netflix. And it's like, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Ooh, How about yes, that? Huh. Let's, let's connect all of their cables with wet noodles instead of actual, uh, you know, instead of actual copper? Ethernet cables. No, you don't, you don't no. get any copper. We're going to jam a fiber optic cable in that uh, that ether that copper ethernet port and let's see you route the ba the traffic through that. <laughs> that was their internal Ooh. policy. Yeah, that was that was yeah. basically the and so the FCC has the power to investigate those kinds of situations now more so than they did before. Now, it's really in the sort of the Schadenfreude of this, you know, Comcast has said, "Oh, we're going to sue." And now they're saying, "Well, we're not actually going to sue, but then if you read the article, what they're going to do is form a coalition of companies that will then sue. So they're not going to sue by themselves. They're going to get together with their buddies, form a coalition, and then that coalition is probably going to sue the FCC. But there's well, even another dimension. Yes, uh, yes, and that's going to be the lobbyist dimension. Is that what you're going with this? <laughs> no, no, no. There was, well, the lobbyist is another thing. That's, the, that's, even, the, that's another, another one? Yeah, that's another another thing that's related to that. <laughs> but the other other thing with all of this FCC stuff is, uh, uh, oh no, I've forgotten. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and cut in with the lobbying thing because that's next on my mind. Uh, you, you mentioned that they're going to use litigation as a thing. Well, they, they said, yeah, we're we're going to get a whole slew of people together and we're going to litigate like crazy. They're also going to lobby the hell out of Congress and Senate and the Senate. Um, and, and you know what? The Congress is already jumping in there. And saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to tolerate this. It's going to destroy the internet. And uh, we're not just going to, where, where's my button? We're not just going to stand by. Let me just go ahead and um, read you this. We will not stand by idly as the White House, using the FCC, attempts to advance rules that imperil the future of the internet. So they are also, in uh, the, the FCC here is supposed to be uh, an entity that works separately from everything. They're supposed to be their own entity that's basically sovereign. They don't take any direction from anyone they have been put in power because we believe them to be the right people to make the right decisions. And Obama has been pressuring the FCC to make these decisions. And so now the Republicans in the House are, are like, aha, this is basically Obama with his hand up their butt moving their lips. 
So and we, we're not going to stand for that. But we see what's going on. Wait a that, minute. That just, I had to use that because that's the only analogy that they they, they like hands in there. Never mind. <laughs> wait, wait. Weren't, weren't we one of the first people to come up with the whole Title II thing? Because we, I mean, we, we go all the way back to the 96 Telecommunications Act. We talk about the 96 Telecommunications Act in the context of Title II, and most people don't even have any idea what that is. We've been talking about that for years. So I submit to you the people that are making the argument about having their, you know, their hand up Obama's butt using him like a sock puppet. The other way around, around. The other way around. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Obama with his hand up the the, the FCC's butt. Okay. Okay. That that sentence, just take that, take that sentence all by itself and, and make a meme out of it. So wait, I'll give you a dollar. if, If, if that's true and we were saying it before Obama and then Obama was saying was telling the FCC what to do does that mean that we tell Obama what to do cuz I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. Although he did yeah. thank Reddit. Did you see that? He had a handwritten thank you note for Reddit and somebody <laughs> some snark some snarky hilarious person on Reddit posted back a handwritten letter that's like, "Oh, no problem, Obama, don't mention it. Can you uh can you also take a look at that whole NSA <laughs> spying on all our stuff thing cuz that would that would maybe be a thing. Oh man, we, <laughs> gotta, we would like you to you know. We've got a list for him. I've, I've got a feeling that Obama wants to go out as like the cool president right now. So now he's doing some things that are going to please the younger generations and some things that are going to secure uh, a better future for us in the information age. But does that mean we're just going to forget about the you know drone strikes and uh, <laughs> you know warrantless wiretapping and all that kind of stuff? I mean that did happen under his watch, even though a lot of it started before he was in power. And the, uh, um, yeah, he never closed Guantanamo, like you said. I, I could go on. Was, the was, other really funny thing that I found was uh, that I thought of that I, the thing that I forgot, but now I remembered, was that Verizon came out with this really snarky press release, and the the press release <laughs> I think was in Morse code, and it was like you know. This this is you know Title II is antiquated. It's so antiquated. It's from the 30s. We're trying to regulate modern technology, you know, with something so ancient from the 1920s. And it's like, well, you know, if you want a historical perspective, let's go all the way back, like even before the Constitution. Something that our international brethren can agree on. And that's the Magna Carta. You know what the Magna Carta says? The Magna Carta says that you know people uh, people well, in this case barons, but we'll we'll pretend it was ordinary people too. Uh, ordinary people have the right to speedy justice, and they should be free of illegal imprisonment. But clearly, because the Magna Carta is from 1215 A.D., that's outdated and doesn't apply anymore. Clearly, I'm banning people in the in the chat right now. But yeah, I totally agree <laughs> with you. Uh, it's oh, well, let's just let's just move on from that and, and talk about some other things that are going on. I don't know. We could, we could probably go on and make a totally separate segment on this. Um, but we want to cover some things that are happening in the rest of the world. Because as net neutrality is becoming a thing here slowly and possibly maybe could be interesting, there are other weird things going on in other parts of the world. First off, um, let's go over to just Europe. Now in the EU, uh, as in the rest of the world, there is there's geo blocking, and if you've been living under a rock, geo blocking is essentially where you know you have um, a movie that you can watch on Netflix in the USA, but if you log on in Germany and try to watch the movie, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. You don't have rights to watch that here in Germany. And so then you go out and you buy a VPN so you can watch the movies you want to watch. Uh, or a lot of times you're trying to buy a movie. And it's like, oh, we're sorry, that movie is not available in in Germany. Whereas if you drive across the border to like Austria, all of a sudden you can watch the movie again. It's just silly. But it's all about rights management because the companies want to maximize their profits by setting up different distribution deals in each market. What that does for you guys is it means you guys don't have access to the stuff you want. And sometimes, even when you show up with sweaty money in your hands, you can't buy the stuff. So what do you do? You probably end up pirating it. But they don't think of it that way. They just think of it as they want to get the maximum profit. And then they complain about the piracy. They've created a distribution problem. And, you know, it's not just me that's fed up with it. It's also Audras and Sip. <laughs> and, yeah, that, I, I don't know how to say the name. Anyway, he's Europe's uh, vice president for the digital single market, and he says geoblocking is annoying. And I think it's kind of funny here if you read the uh, the article. It sounds like one of the main reasons that he is annoyed by it is because it personally affects him. He's trying. One day he was sitting there trying to get access to something, and he's like, "Why? Why can't I watch this? I, I just want to watch the thing. Why can't?" And finally, he was like, "You know what? Damn it! I'm going to do something about it. I'm the Europe vice president for the digital single market. 
I can do something about it. So I think he actually got a little angry and uh, decided to do something about it. He wants to completely end geoblocking. If they can do that in the EU, um, I think that it'll roll out across the world because here's what's going to happen. He's going to, you know, bark and scream and yell. And if it happens, then all of a sudden all the companies will be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Our profits went up. What the hell? And all the people who are running around with wads of money in their, you know, in their hands, just waiting to buy the stuff that they're not allowed to buy are going to be like, yeah, we bought the stuff that you wouldn't let us buy. And they're going to go, oh, well, okay, I guess money is, is good. Even if we don't have, you know, a different distribution deal in each network, I guess it'll be okay if we have your money to, and you can watch things legally. I think that's what's going to happen. And then the rest of the world is going to look at it. And maybe these old idiots who are running these companies who are using, you know, business tactics from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s will look at this entire thing and be like, oh, I guess the problem was us all along. And then you know, remove some of their nonsensical policies. I'm not sure if they'll fully be able to do that because their minds are in upside down and they're still in this old school business mode of thinking where, you know, walled gardens were a good thing. But now that we have the information age, walled gardens don't make as much sense. You end up blocking and frustrating people when they know, you know, it's, it's like before the walled gardens, it was kind of difficult to see over the wall. But now you're creating walled gardens and people are a lot taller because the information age makes you taller. That's my metaphor. And now they can just look over and be like, well, why can't we go over there? And then there's a guy with a gun standing there being like, because I'll shoot you. So that's a good metaphor, huh? I thought that was good. I thought of that. <laughs> I thought of that this morning in the shower and was like, I didn't take a shower this morning. Everything's just lies coming out of my mouth. I should be a politician. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that. That's what's happening in the, in the EU. Yeah. Ready to move on? Or do you got anything else to add to that? I kind of went off on a tangent there, but they think it's kind of it, covered maybe. I like it in theory. It's a breakdown. I, you, you know, the, I was trying to think of an analogy that comes close to this. And it's really um, deregionalized labor. And so, like, in America, we've got the H-1B visa program where we can import people from other countries that do complicated jobs and convert them into citizens. Um, and other countries have similar programs. And, you know, large companies can outsource and buy things in the cheapest place possible. But the average citizen, it's like, oh, you're importing monitors from Korea? Oh, no. It's like, oh, you're buying Windows 8 from, you know, Russia because it's like nine dollars in Russia and and then importing it into the United States. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's not allowed. That's, oh, you're buying that's totally tech, not how college I bought mine. textbooks? No, no, that's not. <laughs> it's like you you're buying college textbooks overseas and importing those. No, no, that's not allowed. That's not allowed. And so I think that this is a very forward again, once again, very forward thinking of the EU. Um, in America, we came dangerously close to having region locked books. So we have this thing that goes back called the first sale doctrine. And that is that if I have a thing and I sell it, then I can't say what happens to that thing after I sell it to somebody else. It's like it's somebody else's thing and they can do something with it. And so this thing happened with textbooks where they tried to say, oh, by opening the textbooks, you agree to the license of the textbook, which is a contract saying that you're not going to resell it. And by a very, very small margin, uh, this it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And by a very, very tiny, tiny just, you know, the skin of your teeth margin, it was decided that, hmm, that would probably be a bad thing and overturn the first sale doctrine stuff. So you can actually go buy things overseas and uh, for cheap and import them. And so that has basically done away with region locks. But the friction of actually being able to do that easily is, is sort of preventing pandemonium in the streets. But here we have a guy in the EU saying, oh, well, you know, we're, we're basically thinking along the same lines. Why don't we just do all this electronically? Because if I can import the content, like if I could go to America and buy something and bring it over here and watch it, that is no different. And it's, that's very good. That's very global village thinking. And we all ought to be thinking that way. Meanwhile, companies are like, oh, God, market segmentation. No, we need the market segmentation. <laughs> we need to be able to sell it for $100 in America and $1,000 in Australia and $9 in Estonia. That's pretty much it. Speaking of the rest of the world, uh, let's go to, where should we go? Um, New Zealand. Look at that New Zealand skyline right there. That's the, uh, that's the space needle, everybody. I just, I'm waiting for the hate mail. I, I've, I've been dying to call it the space needle all day long because I want the hate mail. There's the space needle. And right over here is the small version of the Empire State Building. Um, Don't you mean Dr. Evil's corporate headquarters? Yeah, right over here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's get serious because this is some serious business right here 
PayPal has stopped taking um, has stopped taking payments from Mega, and and so have uh, Visa and Mastercard. Now the reason for this is a bit ridiculous, and I, I mean Mega has 15 million users. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean users. I meant the word criminals. There are 15 million criminals using Mega because Mega, let's just face it, it's not a legitimate service, right? Let's let's just see here what the MPAA. Uh, and the Digital Citizens Alliance have determined. So there was a report published, well, I'm on the wrong screen, there was a report published by uh, Ned Names, and that was funded by those two entities, and they claimed that Mega's business is not a legitimate cloud storage service. And then we've got freaking Senator Leahy from Vermont, who is um, pressuring you know, Visa, MasterCard to cease providing payment, and then they helped pressure PayPal to cease providing payment. Now I'll go ahead and me scold Senator Leahy, Senator Leahy, stop it! We, well, you're you're old. Stop that crap. You, he's a, he's way too in bed with the MPAA and the RIA and all those guys. Go ahead. In the suspension of disbelief for Leahy, the one thing is that the the um, what happened was it was a list, and so Mega was buried in the middle of a list, and it was like uh, Visa and Mastercard should stop accepting payments from. These criminals the HSBC is doing business with and the Mexican drug cartel, oh, and Mega.com, and uh, these people <laughs> eat babies. And, and so Senator Leahy was like, yeah, this sounds great. Rubber stamp. It's awesome. But it's like, wait, Mega might actually be legit. What's going on here? And yeah. so the stats well, I mean, for that are there. I mean, Mega might be legit, but you know what? There may be a couple copyrighted files floating around on Mega. But there may be a couple of copyrighted files floating around on Google Drive, on Apple's, whatever the freak they call their stupid stuff. On, uh, oh, is that what it is? iCloud? Oh, yeah, there's an iCloud. Yeah, of course. I guess I should have just known that. I put an I, I was going to say iBox, or I, I struggle to come up with better terms, so I just put an I in front <laughs> I of struggle. everything. <laughs> I struggle. <laughs> we need a shirt. Oh, God. <laughs> well, that's the shirt of the month. Next month, it'll not well not this coming month. I think this coming month's gonna be rant thirty. Yeah, but yeah, next month after that, it'll be I struggle. If, let me know what you guys think. Of this. Yeah, we need. <laughs> oh God, I can already see the picture now. Uh, some some guy like with his I don't know a MacBook and just face like this and just says I struggle. <laughs> that's awful. Um, where were we? Where the hell were we? Oh yeah, Mega. That's right. Uh, this is Mega derailed right now. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Dropbox, uh, Spider Oak, whatever, I don't even know what the hell that is, but why are they targeting Kim.com all the time? It's probably because of his flamboyance. So you know, if, if Kim could just, you know, take the money and live under a rock, he'd be fine, but he's too much of a vigilante as far as the internet goes, and he's a bit, you know, well, he's freaking cocky and a bit uh, uh, wild, so they, they can't handle that. He's... He's the person that they've chosen to make an example out of, and what they're trying to, you know, show as an example, I am not sure. Yeah. Well, you know, once again, it's like whatever Mega's doing, it is not as bad as what HSBC, the bank, has done and is doing. And so clearly, clearly someone has their priorities mixed up. What's wrong with HSBC? They're great. They're, they're great. Yeah, you put your... <laughs> great I mean... for laundering money. <laughs> Yeah, laundering money and uh, helping you. Never mind. Let's just uh, let's move. On. Let's move over to China, shall we? We've, we're all over the place now. China, they're sort of taking a cue from what's going on in America with the NSA and stuff, um, and, and some of the other parts of the world. And they looked at uh, what's going on, and they said, you know what? It's a good idea. We should put security backdoors and require uh, everyone's encryption key for every every company in China. So now they want security backdoors into software. They want full encryption keys. Um, this this looks like it's already gone through. So now, everything you do in China, uh, VPN access, no more. They they want the encryption key for that. So even if you have a VPN for for whatever, they're supposed to have the encryption key. Um, if if you're, you know, doing a financial transaction, well, they're gonna have that. You're just gonna have to trust them to be benevolent. Now, the reason we even talk about China right now is they are uh, the second largest economy in the world and. This year, uh, this year they're probably going to be the first. I thought they should have already been the first as of now, but sometime during this year they are going to transition over and become the largest economy in the world with far uh, less debt compared to the you know uh, the USA. Um, but when you think about it in, in global terms, 
I don't know. I don't know why everyone writes off China. They're huge, and most of the things that we buy are from China, um, and a lot of the you know the world's ideology is from China. They're sort of beating everyone at the the the, the marketing uh, the the market capitalism game um, when they they're a communist country and they're 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 winning the capitalist game. It's kind of crazy, but I think it's good to keep a really close eye on China and see what they're doing because stuff that they do can also trickle into other parts of the world, and if it becomes a norm there. Uh, yeah, it's kind of dangerous. A lot of the internet traffic does go through there as well. So, I don't, I don't know enough about China culturally, or uh, I, I got the impression through the '80s and '90s and early 2000s that uh, China would sort of look to what the United States was doing to try to figure out how heavy-handed they needed to be internally. And so there's obviously very bad things like the Tiananmen Square thing and the stuff that they still do around making sure that no one has any idea what happened at Tiananmen Square and that that's not a thing. And it's sort of the subtle manipulation of that. So we see that happening in China, and that was always like, oh, that would never hear, that would never happen here, and never, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then this NSA stuff and Snowden and all the stuff of really the last 10 years you know, there's a lot of parallels between the way that China conducts itself and the way that the U.S. conducts itself. And so yeah. what China's asking for here in law, they're just saying, this is how it is. Whereas in America, we've sort of surreptitiously sought the same level of access. And so I really, I, it really leaves me in a, in, a, in a quandary. I don't know how to look at this now. I don't know, you know, is it a, this is a reflection of my own culture just approaching the approaching it a different way the state wants access to this this is true of both obama you know and 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 the chinese but it's very much seems to be a case of do as i say not as i do because obama when talking about chinese is like no american companies must be protected they can have all the encryption they want and you know when we're dealing with on the chinese side the chinese are like no we need to be able to look at everything when we're talking about our intelligence organization, the NSA is like, born or domestic, we don't care. We're going to capture it all. It doesn't matter to us. <laughs> Just hoover it all up. I guess Schrodinger's I, yeah. data, it's all foreign until we look at it, and then it might be foreign. We don't know. That's that's actually a really good one. Schrodinger's data. Hmm. <laughs> more t-shirt ideas. Here. Also, I, I guess China's more socialist than communist. I have to Google to see exactly what their uh, mode of government is. I guess socialism. I don't even know. I, I've been there a few times, but yeah. And we'll be back there soon. Should be interesting. All right. Uh, oh, no. I've done something terrible. Oh, I've lost you back there, Wendell. Let me just uh, fix it real quick. Wendell's disappeared, everyone. And Wendell is back. There we I go. I need a cookie. <laughs> yeah. It went away for a second, but now it's back. I made it work. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about some hardware, shall we? The future of computers could communicate like humans. Now, DARPA has a, a project going on, and they're trying to make AI uh, communicate on a human level, tell stories, uh, and that sort of thing. And they're, they're doing several different things to either train the AI, or, or they've got several different tasks that they're trying to get the AI to perform. Uh, one, is, one is storytelling, because, I mean, an AI, like, you could talk to Siri, or you can talk, you could say, okay, Google, and you could tell it to search for things, and it's it's still just a utility. It doesn't communicate on a human level. There's no nuance to it. There's no, um, you know, humor is not injected into these things. Storytelling is pretty much impossible. But what DARPA is doing here is they're sitting down with a human and, and the AI, and they're telling stories back and forth. You know, the AI tells a story, then the human tells a story. And for a human, it's kind of, well, unless you're uh, just completely creatively bankrupt, yes, creatively bankrupt, I guess, then you should be able to tell a story pretty easily, even if you're just making something up or or looking at the back of something and being like, hey, I went to Salt Lake City the other day and we had beer and it was really windy and, uh, you know, you could just tell a story. But a machine has trouble doing that because the stories are abstract. I guess abstract thought is, is re really difficult for, for machines in general. And then the other thing they're doing is um, having a human sit down with a computer and with a bunch of blocks, you start building something. Now, the catch is that the human, um, you know, the human does not know what you're building and neither does uh, the AI. So they just have to build something. They have to cooperate together to make something that's cohesive. And um, once they're able to master that, machines will uh, be one step closer to being chatty. I don't know. How do, you, how do you feel about having a chatty computer? 
So you could just like, almost like a human, like, hey, would you mind grabbing that for me? All those files, can you go ahead and send them over? And the computer's like, yeah, no problem. Uh, do you also need this? Or do you want me to do this for you as well? Like just back and forth and, and joking around. And the computer could maybe, I, I would probably get a computer that, that was um, big on severely bad puns, like dad humor and stuff. That's what I would want. <laughs> I, <laughs> the, the punishment box. This is, this is probably where the digital personal assistant is... Uh going to come in doing this this kind of thing i really um i really think that's where microsoft is going to hope that uh is, is going to take cortana I, I think that it's going to be all about digital assistant and uh, digital assistance information lookup uh they're going to rely on you to use like OneNote, the uh the information keeping ability of OneNote, keep all your stuff in one note be able to do the search in one note i can see that that's what they're building I think that's very much what they have in mind to use with the uh, the personal digital assistant. I think that it'll be a while before we get to storytelling and, and, and until we get to some of the other components of it, but I think that we're actually going to be pretty deep in personal assistant uh, territory. The technology already exists. It, it could come out tomorrow. It could be just like, you know, when, when the iPhone launched, it was like one day we had it and one day we didn't really have it because... Where we are right now with that technology is about where we were with touch computers before, you know, Steve Jobs sat down and said, "No, let's let's re let's rethink this with um, touching the screen with your finger." And so somebody's got to sit down and say, "Let's rethink this with context sensitive computing." So with with my own stuff like my home server and my home setup and the, the system that I have with the security system and the media server and things like that, it, it seems like it's intelligent, but it's really just a collection of scripts doing things. So, like, you know, when I pull up and I go to the home server that's a web page, it's, it's contextually aware. There's an uh, Android application that fits really well with that called Tasker that's contextually aware. It's like, oh, you're home. You usually want to do, like, these three things. You want to do one of these three things? And so I don't really have to dig through anything. I can just sort of coast, sort of lean one way or the other and it'll do what I want. And it's like, oh, you watch these TV shows. These TV shows are similar to these other TV shows. I'm just gonna go ahead and record them and see if you wanna watch them one day when you're bored. And it's like, oh, I didn't really tell it to record that, but oh, that's fine, I'll watch that, see what happens. So I think that this, this kind of thing is gonna be the new marketing. I think that if you have an agent that works for you, that you can trust, then uh, those companies that wanna use that as an advertising platform will be able to make an obscene amount of money. But I think that can be done without the consumer being a commodity. I think that I can say, I can tell my bot, I'm looking for these types of things, and then my bot could go and find it. But if companies make it easier to interface with my bot to be like, hey, this, this is the things that we have, and you know, it's easier uh, to do that, then I think that that's sort of gonna transform the way that marketing is done. You, you, you touched on a key thing there, and the word was trust. There are some open source alternatives to this, but. I'm afraid the first iterations of the, the chatty computer may end up being from Google or Microsoft, uh, not Apple. I don't think it'll be from, even though series come along, I think Microsoft and Google might be ahead of the game behind the scenes and haven't released their new Uber thing. But then you're going to have, you know, always listening chatty computers all around the house that are going to be talking to you, asking you what you need. And I guess my concern with that is like with a human being, you know when they're in the room and then you know when they're listening. But with this sort of thing, it's always listening. And sometimes you may take for granted that your house is listening to you or your device is listening to you. And it could be a great marketing tool for these companies. They'll be able to sell the, the data. And if you're talking like, oh, my God, my butt hurts, then you're going to get Preparation H advertisements in your Gmail. Just mysteriously. All of a sudden, there it is. And you're like, and then if, if you're like, hey, computer, why, why is this there? And you're like, you said your butt hurted. So I thought I would fix your butt hurt. <laughs> if only it were that easy to cure butt hurt. <laughs> anyway, that's my that's my concern. I want open source versions of this stuff that can run on a local server. It may end up being a large program, but I don't care if it's a terabyte. It's, you know, I'll, I'll throw it on one of these uh one of these handy dandy Corsair Neutron Series XT solid state drives, 960 gigabytes of Fizen powered speed. Product placement Taco Bell. I <laughs> just made $700. No, it, just, it was just laying here on the desk, and I thought it'd be funny. Seven hundred dollars, you suckers! No, I'm just, no, I'm just I would never do that. But, but seriously, guys, no, no, for real. I, I just no. 
we're just messing with you. We don't. We don't even. Yeah. It's not even. No, a thing. We, we we would never. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's move on and talk about some hardware, shall we? So speaking of hardware, I happen to have this Neutron Series XT drive that's also great for shaving. Um, Dollar Shave Club. Uh, <laughs> Where's that banana? We need to shave the banana. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> Oh, that would be bad. That would be very bad. Oh, God. My face. Uh, DirectX 12. It will allow a, a blasphemous task. DirectX 12. That was, I sounded like, what's his name? Christopher. Blasphemous task. That Now, I don't know who I am. Somewhere, bet somewhere between Christopher Walken and uh, Shatner. Anyway, a, a multi-GPU between GeForce and Radeon. Uh, we're not even talking like two different families of the same brand. We're talking... GeForce and Radeon, multi-GPU, worlds collide, asteroid hit the Earth, dinosaurs are dead, fire from the sky, sheeps and lions sleeping together comfortably without any fear. The world is over as we know it. That was a bit dramatic, don't you think? <laughs> no, <laughs> because it's serious. So things are not going to work the same with DirectX 12. Of course, um, you know, you have lower level access to the hardware. And you know, DirectX, um, for the last several iterations, AMD's been screaming like, hey, hey, they're, they're ignoring us. And you know, NVIDIA's like, hey, you know, we're working together with uh, Microsoft over here on DirectX, everything's gonna be good. And AMD's like, hey, we've, we've got some ideas. Hey, 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 guys, listen, listen. And uh, Microsoft's like, screw off, you, you bunch of idiots. And so now they, you know, they came out with Mantle. And Microsoft's like, hey, what's, that? what's that over there? What are, you, what, are you, what are you guys doing? That's pretty cool. Uh, I like that. It's faster than our DirectX. Can we get some of that? So AMD actually is working together with DirectX 12. And the way that they're going to be doing SLI is going to be a little bit different as well. Whereas uh, normally uh, Crossfire and SLI are both SLI invented by uh, 3DFX way back when. Uh, anyway, um, it's it's no longer going to be the, you know, one card does one line, one card does the next line. It's not going to be like that anymore. What's going to happen now is that you can put a few different cards in there and it's all going to have to be done by the developers. They're going to have to set it up so that, you know, different tasks can be allocated to different things. So, for instance, you can have one card do the lighting effects and the other card render in polygons and whatever the hell else. I don't know, the rendering, the, doing the world render, um, doing tessellation and that sort of thing. So you can basically have different cards doing different tasks. And it may be possible for those to be intelligently assigned to the different cards. And here's the other beautiful thing. And I am so happy about this. This may be a rumor, but am I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be breaking any. Um, no one told me this. I made it up. So if anyone asks, I, I have no idea where I got this information. But if you have multiple GPUs in the same system and you're running DirectX 12 with a DirectX 12 game that's been coded properly, all your GPUs will be seen as one mega GPU and the RAM will finally be shared. So if you have three cards with four gigs of RAM each, you're going to have 12 gigabytes of video memory. That is one healthy frame buffer, everybody. Console <laughs> gamers get in a wreck, but not too bad, just like a fender bender. One thing that I have seen developers bitching about that I don't know if it's fixed in DirectX 12 beta is that, okay, like let's say that you're doing a special effect. And on a certain card, that special effect is very inexpensive to do. And on another card, that special effect is very expensive to do. There's not an easy way for developers to tell what the capabilities of the card are in terms of those special effects or how it's coded or what it's going to run or, you know, exactly how that's going to work, exactly how that's going to play out. Um, and that's probably a problem because it's like, oh, with this graphics card, it's running at 400 FPS. And at this graphics card, it's running at 30 FPS because that card has constrained memory or something. Or like you get the new GTX 970. And so the, 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 the game is like, how much video RAM is there? Four gigs. And it's like, great, I can load four gigs of textures. And then all of a sudden your frame rate goes to hell because that last time <laughs> no, you cannot. is yep. lower than Christmas. And so yep. it's like, there's not an easy way for developers to tell. Like Microsoft is saying, oh, the interface to the card is so generic now, developers don't need to know. And developers are saying, well, now, wait a minute, that's not necessarily true. We, we kind of do need to know what's going on there. So, eh. Cannot wait for that stuff to come out. And, uh, oh, man, I've got some secrets. I have some secrets. I can't tell you guys the secrets. It's awful. This is empty. That's awful as well. I am very surprised that the... The VRAM architecture is such that it's it is basically additive now. It's not exact. It's not really additive. It's uh, I mean it is, but it's not. 
because uh, the cards are working so independently that, um, uh, you know, well, if you've got like two graphics cards in there, half the screen could be on one and half the screen could be on the other. Or more properly, what's probably going to happen in the first generation, the geometry will be on one card and in one card's VRAM and the textures will be on the other card's VRAM and in, and processed and handled by the other card. So effectively, you get to use the VRAM of both cards, even though the VRAM is being used for different things, which is really pretty cool in this architecture. Yep. More hardware news. Shall we go to some other stuff? Uh, this one, yes. Uh, Lenovo has promised a bloat-free um, PC, and they're giving free McAfee subscriptions to Superfish. You know what? Everything bad that I said about uh, about Lenovo, everything I said about how heinous it was that they would load these things into the bootloader, everything I said about how you know it was awful that Lenovo would abuse their customers in a way that would make them completely vulnerable when they went into coffee shops so that people could still steal their personal financial information, their passwords to their email and Facebook and everything else. All that bad stuff, you know, is made better now because Lenovo is going to give those guys a free copy of McAfee. <laughs> I thought it wasn't supposed to be called McAfee anymore because the guy that wrote McAfee that retired, that some sort of oh, super yeah. like Bond villain genius was like, stop calling it that because this is horrible. Stop, stop sullying my name. There's a great YouTube video of him smoking a cigar by lighting hundred dollar bills on fire or something. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. I guess the company's now McAfee free. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so, yeah, you know what? I don't even care, Lenovo. You guys can all go blow a goat. How about that? Send me a laptop. I'd love to review it because that's what we do around here. We'll say anything you want as long as you send us a laptop for free and maybe some money. Go blow a goat, Lenovo, for real. What you guys did was the most heinous thing that I have ever seen a company do. Is that do. evil? Should we not have done that? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> oh, It's actually God. funny, uh... It, uh, there's an Ars Technica article you guys can Google that uh, they, so based on that stuff that we found, uh, they found like 12 more programs to do the same thing from a whole bunch of other vendors. And so, of course, Lenovo is taking the heat. But it turns out that those kinds of programs were everywhere and we just didn't know what to look for. All right, what's next on the old list here? Oh, IBM is unveiling uh, uh, this new Internet of Things starter kit. Oh, it's, it's IBM and ARM. This is pretty cool. It's a, it's a little starter kit for the, well, the Internet of Things. Everyone is that's like the new thing. When we went to Maker Fair, the Internet of Things was everywhere. So this little kit is going to come with a core uh, Cortex M4 processor. Um, it's only 120 megahertz, but that's pretty much all you need for the, a lot of the small tasks like running scripts and stuff. <clears throat> Pardon me, 256 kilobytes of RAM and uh, one megabyte of flash. Tiny little thing. Um, there's, I guess it's an update from last year's model. So pretty cool. This is if you really want to start cool. programming some Internet or things, this would be a, a good way to start. Unfortunately, as the the Samsung smart TVs that we were talking about last week have demonstrated, the Internet of Things is woefully insecure. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Maybe you could be the person who get one who gets one of these things and creates um, some security. You know, <laughs> or you I figure something out. I don't know. Let's, let's it's great. It's like, it's like, I don't know what's going on. My internet at home is always slow. It's like, oh, it turns out some Russian guys figured out how to run the Pirate Bay on my smart TV. So my smart TV has <laughs> been hosting the Pirate Bay and I had no idea. That's the internet of things right there. It's like my Samsung's fridge is downloading torrents from China. I don't understand what's happening. And it's like, oh, something, something Beijing, communist or uh, capitalist pigs. I don't even know. It's just bad. It's, it's. We would know we know everything's gone to hell when our refrigerator and our toaster are mining bitcoins for someone in you know <laughs> the Middle East or something. I have to negotiate yeah. to get the milk out of the fridge, and it's like it's going to be <laughs> point oh five bitcoin to, before I'll release the latch. Your refrigerator has a things. Your refrigerator has a virus, and everything in there will be infected <laughs> unless you deposit four dollars <laughs> to run an antivirus on your fridge. When they get, can you, know, you imagine so when they get that on your toilet? Ideas. Man, when they get that stuff on your toilet, <laughs> and then you can't even use the bathroom, um, all, all the snakes in the general vicinity will be rerouted to your toilet if you do not. It's like pay. It's it's like uh, if, if you guys ever watched the movie The Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> imagine that, but all those appliances what? are working for the man. <laughs> well, hold on a minute. There's a movie called The Brave Little Toaster. 
Is it talking like <laughs> Hollywood feature film or is this like a kids movie? No, no, it, it's a it's a it's a car it's like a kids cartoon from like fifty years ago, and it's a it's about this the these these. This family moves from the country to the city, but they leave all their appliances behind. And so the appliances, like, try to, like, find their family. It's like Toy Story from before Toy Story was a thing. You know what's like, funny? Because Toy Story to... it's, it's funny because back then in the 50s, the Brave Little Toaster, that would have been a kid's movie. But now, in this day and age, that would be the new Hollywood blockbuster, like, summer feel-good hit of the year. Like, you know, things were getting hot for the Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> it would be, like, the big Hollywood, like, drama... And then, like, the toaster would have emotions, and there'd be a scene where, like, a girl can't have her toast, and she's crying, and the toaster's like, I don't know what we can do. My cord is frayed, and we can't heat the toast anymore. I'm sorry, <laughs> toaster. I'm sorry. Uh, it's kind of... I just did the whole movie. It's, uh... Oh, no, I've lost you again. Damn this machine. Stupid machine. There we go. It's fixed. Am I back? You're back. <laughs> yes. Stop re stop relegating me to that corner of the internet. No. Uh, I've uh, got this new mouse what? with some macros, and I accidentally set up the macro to change back and forth from one scene to the other to the button that's also the forward and back button on the browser. Oops. And I didn't test that's it bad. because I just did it right before. I was like, yay, I'll, I'll never have to have my hand in this stupid position right here anymore. I can just like chill out and use my mouse, and it's been awful. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump off a bridge, but I won't do it until later. Anyway. It could be worse. Yeah. No, that yeah, movie was kind of a dark movie for a Disney movie. I mean, it had a happy the ending movie? ultimately, but yeah, but there were, I mean, it was like, I don't know. You just, you'd have to see it. All right. So Intel is planning on moving to, to seven nanometer in 2018 and next year, possibly, uh, well, actually in 20, 2016, possibly 14 nanometer. Yeah. Now, after, the reason we even bring this up is because yeah, 14 nanometers is going to be crazy. Um, the heat's going to be, I don't even know how they're going to dissipate so much heat, but I guess it will require, you know, less power. Seven nanometer is about where they're going to stop and then start looking looking to alternatives to silicon, uh, like different types of alloys, um, gallium arsenic. Transparent uh, aluminum. Yeah. <laughs> there no. you go, transparent <laughs> weapons grade aluminum. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess graphene is not in the, listed in this article. It's probably going to be carbon nanotubes, and everyone's going to get uh, the the lung fungus, the lung the the lung death from carbon nanotubes. I don't know, uh, but it is, it'll be interesting to see what happens next. It is kind of funny that uh, uh, you know <laughs> they're getting into the situation where uh, silicon is not exotic enough of an atom, and they need to come up with something else. But the transition to that. I can't imagine the transition to that is going to be quick. Now, IBM has done some R&D on this uh, into non-silicon materials, the gallium arsenide, and uh, some other more exotic materials. I, uh, it's going to be rough. It's going to be really rough to switch away from silicon. So we are going to see a lot of stuff sort of stay, I think, at 28, 22, 14, 12 nanometers for many, many years to come in a lot of different appliances. Um, yeah. But I will be surprised. I, I, there, actually, I would say that it's more likely that we will switch um, architectures. So, like, if you want to see something that's kind of mind-blowing, check out this, the mill architecture for CPUs. I bet we do that on silicon before it's actually viable to switch to something other than silicon. The mill architecture could be the next best thing. I'm bringing up a video on it now because I haven't, I haven't really looked at any uh, videos on it. Oh, there's a whole long thing on it here from yeah it's a, it's a, it's like uh-huh well i'll have to watch this uh presentation a little later uh-huh all right next up on the list oh yeah so we're gonna talk about some science and uh have you seen those articles that are saying you know we're gonna you know transplant heads from from humans in 2017 because we've already done it on monkeys and we've already done it on rats, and the monkeys were just happy. They went right back to work the next day. No, they did not. <laughs> they did not I've go back them. to work the next day. I've seen them, and we're here to tell you to point and laugh. So here's the the, 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 pro the problem. Um, in order to do this correctly and, and maintain functionality of the body, you have to connect the spinal column correctly. And so they were able to transplant the heads, but connecting the spinal column and then making that work... Well, they're probably going to have to cross a few more bridges until they get to that point. And, you know, they, they have made some pretty interesting breakthroughs in, in recent science uh, that could help to 
cure or alleviate some forms of paralysis and that those things may be able to be used to uh, apply to this reconnection of the you know the spinal column and that sort of thing but right now they haven't been able to do that i believe they're all yeah, getting well, a bit too nervous <laughs> let me summarize this for you so with monkeys which is probably one of the more grotesque experiments that i've read about in rats they cut off their heads and reattach them to different bodies and they continue to live for several hours um, but they didn't bother with anything on the spinal column. And so your spinal column is basically a giant bundle of the biological equivalent of Ethernet cables that go everywhere in your body. And so if you could imagine cutting a bundle of Ethernet cables that are, I don't know, like if, you, if we were to scale it up, it would be about a half a mile wide. And then we would just like randomly plug those back in. Uh, chances are things aren't going to work the way that they used to. So these experiments that this is talking about did not even bother doing that. They didn't even, so like any function that's in your head, so like moving your eyes, you know, moving your, your mouth, uh, blinking, that kind of thing you could do because the wiring to that part was not messed up. But anything else, like say breathing, heartbeat, you know, those kinds of things were not happening as a result of being connected to your brain. They were happening artificially for a few hours at least. Um, and so that's basically what they've done with mice and monkeys. And so I think that what's going to happen with this is not body transplants as you've read about, but I think if somebody's body is messed up, like say somebody's liver is messed up or there's some kind of an infection in the body, um, they might be able to get somebody's brain running on independent life support of the rest of their body. And so like maybe they could have a donor body or maybe they could have like one of those fake kidneys or something. And so your brain ends up being isolated, having its own blood flow and oxygen supply from something other than your body while your body is being repaired. I think that that's where this research is going to go medically. And some dumbass journal article uh, was looking at this and being like, oh, head transplants, this is great. But what's probably going to happen is that they just use a donor body to keep the head alive while they repair the body that the head is attached to. Because all those nerves... No, and until we get nano medicine, moving those nerve bundles is just not going to happen. I'm wondering. Uh, well, I had, I had something interesting. I forgot where I'm going with this. I, I'm wondering if it's going to be more efficient because you know, once they do figure this stuff out, I wonder if it's going to be more efficient to just cryogenically freeze your brain or, or your head, or if it's going to be better just to take your brain out and have it living on its own supply until you get a new body or something. I don't know. And I wonder. I mean. The body and all the cells age. I guess the brain ages as well, but will the... I guess if you replace the body, will the brain be able to last a lot longer is what I'm thinking. I mean, like, will you be able to take your brain and put it into new bodies and then have another body grow and another body grow and another body grow and just keep taking your brain out and put it from one body to the next? I wonder if... I wonder how long you could get away with that before your brain gets too old. I, I mean, I does, does, the, does the brain age like the rest of our body? I don't know. The nervous fibers and things would never survive a transplant like that. I think that the the brain is so intricate and relies on so many extremely delicate nanoscale stru structures that doing anything around a brain transplant is just never going to happen. It's going to always be easier to repair the body that it's in. Um, possibly, maybe, we might be able to build interfaces so that if somebody is decapitated, we could do an artificial interface to it and simulate a body or have a robotic body. But I think that that's way 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 off because the the nervous system is just so hugely complicated it's crazy and transplanting it i mean if we were good at transplanting that there wouldn't be any disabled people because it's like oh you know there's a there's a tiny 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 problem with your spinal cord that connects to your legs let's just go ahead and repair that that is a very tiny scale problem versus oh let's sever a head and replace it at the neck so eh. I guess the last thing that I did about this whole entire thing, I feel bad for the monkeys. I mean, I guess I should feel equally bad for the rats because they're all living organisms and all that stuff. But what did they do wrong to deserve this? Why don't they take like you know um, murderers and rapists and, and make them the 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 the, um, the test subjects? That's what I think they should do. But they they people will people will never go for that in modern society because it sounds awful. But if I was the king of the universe, it would be those guys. Who'd be like, oh yeah, just, just take their heads off and try, see if you can. These two guys here, they did some heinous crimes. Can you see if you can take their heads off and switch them? And if they live, well, they can go free. That'd be great. I'd do it. Well, there was there was uh, with the whole like biological like reversing the aging process 
Um, there was a, an article related to that uh, with mice. Uh, it was uh, uh, they reversed the aging in mice, and for the mice that didn't die of cancer, uh, they didn't start to have problems with their brain until the mice were about three or four times longer than their normal lifespan. So if everything is perfect medically and we solve the cancer problem, because it turns out when you live for a long time, even if you're not aging, mm, cancer is still a thing. Uh, so if we fix that, um, you're still looking at three to 400 years. Everybody in the comments who's arguing AMD and Intel, shut the hell up and watch the show or go make a sandwich. <laughs> For the, for the love of this God. This is why we don't watch the YouTube comments, because, I mean, really, look at that. That's crazy. Why, I mean, I clicked over there, and I'm, like, thinking they're going to be talking about something relevant. 80% of the comments are like, AMD sucks. They're for, for poor people. Intel is for idiots. I hope you catch on fire. You know, just that type of nonsense. Is the way it, it Intel's new AMD architecture is sort of interesting, and we should probably talk about that at some point, but it's all here. Oh, wait, wait, you said, right you said Intel's new AMD architecture. You mean AMD's new x86 um, architecture? Yes, AMD's new x86 architecture. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Intel's new AMD architecture is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it turns out it's pretty good. Uh, let's, let's, since we've been talking about beating each other, let's talk about um, this Aussie company. It wants to bring back gladiatorial battles, and they're doing so by making these carbon uh, fiber suits. And they're basically suits that are going to be impervious to weapon strikes. I guess you'll still feel a bit of bludgeoning and that sort of thing, but the... The interesting thing here is beneath the suits, there are a series of very complicated sensors that will detect the type of hit, how hard you were hit, and where you were hit, and then, you know, you'll be um, damaged. This is basically like extremely high-tech LARPing. That's all this. Every, I would read this, and there's like, bring black gladiatorial battles. Dude, just just Google, you know, like LARPing, and uh, boffer LARPing is all this is. It's just boffer LARPing for rich people. And people with um, too much money. That's the same thing as rich people. It's it's basically totally, it's fancy it's fancy boffer lopping, I'm sorry. They they've missed the boat on this. It's already too late. Leonard Nimoy is dead. There's no way they can have the battle royale kickoff battle with Nimoy and Shatner and the No No That would have been the best. Yeah, there's now I'm not even interested anymore. Let's go ahead and talk about some video games. Um, this sort of piqued my interest a bit. There's an N64-inspired game called A Hat in Time coming out uh, on March 7th for Steam. And I, I, the only reason I'm mentioning this, I don't even know if it looks like a good game, but I, I think it's kind of interesting to see a 3D platformer in the style of Banjo-Kazooie and Mario 64 because almost all of the platformers that are coming out are 2D side-scrolling puzzle platformers that are all made with the same piece of software, and the jump height is almost all the same. So there's a lot of games that are very similar coming out. And they just keep coming out. More and more sides. I, I like side-scrolling games. They're fun. Side-scrolling indie games are fun. But we have a lot of them and there aren't many that are coming out that um, harken back to the 3D platformers that were a ton of fun. Like back, Mario was a ton of fun back in the day. And other games like that were a ton of fun. So very interesting to see... Um, to see with Gears for Breakfast is the name of the company that's making this. Yes, Gears for Breakfast. Very interesting to see that someone is, uh, you know, making a game like this. It's kind of cool. Uh, next up, so there's a big announcement from Bethesda at E3, and there's a lot of speculation as to what the announcement is. I think we can probably say that it's going to be Fallout 4. I mean, you look at all the other stuff. It's not time for Doom. It's, I mean, you know, it's, it's, they've they've been working on Doom, but the horror stories that are surrounding the whole development of the of, of the new Doom game make me think that it's not ready for prime time yet. Uh, Rage, who no one really cared about. Rage, Brink, nobody cared about Brink. Quake, Elder Scrolls, yeah, we've got. See, Elder Scrolls has been satisfied. Wayne's Gretzky hockey. This article is ridiculous. Yeah, there's gonna be. It's gonna. They're gonna. They've got a huge press conference coming up. And they're all going to get up there on stage. That would be the greatest thing ever if they trolled the audience by putting up a bunch of like banners and maybe even decorating the entire booth in like a you know post-apocalyptic you know stuff. And then they're up there and they're like they get on stage and they're like, "Are you guys ready for Wayne Gretzky hockey too?" <laughs> you know what? <laughs> That's what it's going to be. I would I would actually like to see Wayne Gretzky's chivalry. Wayne Gretzky's <laughs> chivalry. You mean like a. <laughs> a soccer fighting game? Yes. <laughs> soccer. Hockey. I barely know her. 
uh, no, you come out with like the hockey stick, and that's your that's your melee weapon. Man, I always used. To, I remember I used to always just have the the biggest trouble with soccer and uh, hockey. I always used to say hawker and socky because I always lumped them together <laughs> in my brain. And whenever someone was talking to me about it, I'd be like, I don't really care for hawker and socky. I mean, soccer and whatever it is. Uh, hockey's all right though. Socky's yeah, what you, you wash like. hibachi down with. <laughs> and hawker is what you do when you're spitting something out of your throat, right? <laughs> so I think it's going to be Fallout 4. I want to know what you guys think in the comments. And I cannot wait to see what, they, what they've what they done. With, uh, it's probably going to be using a, a glorified Skyrim engine. My God, there better not be memory limits and all that nonsense. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they might use a different graphics engine, but whatever. I, I think they could do a steampunk Fallout crossover. Not steampunk in a traditional sense exactly but a version of the fallout universe where you're like you're a tinkerer like you're somebody like you're in one of the vaults where there's only like five people left alive and you you built all these things to keep you company but you're a tinkerer and so when you emerge into the wasteland it's like most of the stuff that you do is machine repair and tinkering and, and that kind of thing and you've got your your r2d2 companion robot slash tool chest slash cnc mill slash lathe to help you make things I mean, it's an open game. I, I think it might be interesting if they would add that as an option that you could start as a tinkerer and then it would have sort of that flavor. I mean, there in, in the old Fallout games, you, you could modify and build weapons out of different components and stuff. So there's a small element of that, but they did, it's not too in-depth. You know, the, the crafting yeah, system really, is not like really too over the top. But I love yeah. building weapons, but it was just, it's like, it's not as good. It's not as bad. I forgot what I, I built some kind of a terrible shrapnel cannon that was really powerful and made a bunch of weird noises in it. It hurt, but it, it took forever to reload and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't remember what was wrong with it, but yeah, it was fun. The, all right, last the thing we're going to talk about one was was my favorite because you could just gather up all kinds of random junk and like uh, pool balls with the best. And it's like oh, I'm carrying a bunch of pool balls, and then it's like I'm going to mow down that death claw. And I was like, Nyeh. that was a lot of fun. <laughs> pool balls. Just yeah. let me just uh, corner pocket <laughs> dead. dead. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this AI that Google has uh, constructed. It is a brain-like artificial intelligence. Now, there are several different AIs out there that uh, play video games. Now, the difference in this one is they haven't given the game any instructions whatsoever. They sit the game down, and it's got a learning algorithm, and then the game plays through all these old games. So far, it's played through 49 old Atari 2600 games without any instructions. And you guys can come in here and click on these videos and watch. It's kind of interesting. It shows you the progression uh, at first, it was like, I don't know what's going on. This is after playing 100 matches, and it's like, okay. And then you skip forward a little bit, and it's learning a little better. It's, uh, you know, this is after a few hundred sessions. But then after many, many sessions, you can see on top, it's it's determined that you need to, you know, it's just, I guess, not Pong, but I forget what the name of this game is. Maybe it's, I don't remember. It's determined that the best strategy is to um, bump the ball up onto the top so that it, uh, you never mind. But you guys know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm struggling here for the, I forgot the name of this game. Anyway, um, there it is playing all these old games. So, yeah. Pretty interesting stuff. I guess I should do some advertising now for our sponsors, which is us. Um, guys, I want to mention that the uh, Chaos and Sue shirt here, it will be gone in just a matter of a few days. The beginning of February is the end for this. Um, I also want to thank you guys for, for you know, going all out with the quality. And it's, we've got two different qualities of the shirt here. We've got the standard cotton, which is very soft, uh, full cotton. But some people want, there's a slightly, I, I guess, slightly softer shirt. I don't know. I, we go back and forth. But I also like the way that the print is on this one. This is a tri-blend shirt. Uh, it's 50 polyester and then 25% rayon, 25% cotton. And this one has a bit more of an athletic fit, maybe slightly slightly softer and uh, the print on this one has a distressed look so there's that and that's on the store right now and again just a couple more days and those things are gone and that's going to be it uh, and then we'll have our new design of the month which is going to be a rant 30 shirt it's going to be uh, out very soon also we now have some waz coasters because everyone uh the waz brand is doing pretty well a lot of people like the waz name so there's some waz coasters on there and a number of other things on the store as usual and keep sending us ideas. If I use your idea, I will give you uh, some money. You know, that's all there is to it. If we use your stuff, we're going to give you some money. It's not just one of those things where, like, we leech off of the audience. Hey, the audience has good ideas. Let's make money on all the audience's ideas. Yeah. Now, we'll, we'll give you guys some money. So that's how that'll work. 
All right. Anything we should say in closing? Uh, should I show them what the new website looks like? It's looking better. It's looking pretty good. We, we might Everybody roll it out on. this weekend. Look, oh, really? This weekend? Dun, 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 dun. dun. <clears throat> Maybe they can wait. I don't know. You know what? You know what I, just, I discovered today that I was really excited about. Um, that you can come on here, and you can reply to someone, and you can use the at thing, and it. Uh, let's, I'll just show you right now. I can come on here, and I can go like at Wendell, and look at that. Oh yeah, right there's Wendell. You can click on Wendell's name, and then hey Wendell, and then I just I'm just replying with a bunch of garbage text. And would you look at that? I just posted, and it's at Wendell. If you click on that, it'll bring up his profile, and then you can go to his profile. And it also sends him a notification. You get the notifications up here on this little drop down. It'll give him a notification that, hey, someone mentioned you. I, I, I was, when I noticed that, I was like, damn, this new forum does just about everything. So this is the dark theme. I'm not sure if we're going to have a light theme available for launch, but I like my dark theme because it's easy on the eyes. All right, I'll, I'm feeling uh, pretty good right now. So I will take two questions from the audience as soon as the audience catches up. Just two. Then we're going to call it quits and... Uh, I'm going to go do nothing because my computer is in shambles over there in the corner. Actually, it's... You guys want to see my new computer? Uh, maybe I should go get it. Should I go... Should I go get, Wendell, should I go get my new computer? Uh, if you want, yeah. That would be yeah, good so to wait while we're waiting for questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll go grab my new computer. It's over here, and you guys can take a gander at it. And I can remind bad. them about the whole Linux and Enterprise channel. I've got three Linux videos in the queue. I just need to finish them, and, and then they'll be good. And they're going to be a little bit rough. They're, it turns out the, my, the uh, video was doing that corruption thing, so I'm sorry about that. But that's not really a big deal. We'll just have to deal with it. Could be worse. You'll you'll just I don't need it. So questions? Yes. Questions? Where are the questions? All right, I'm back, but I gotta get my headpiece on. Questions. All right, I've, here it's on the desk right now. I will uh, show it off right fast. Somebody like this. Oh, it's out of focus. I saw somebody say something forward. about a Model M. Look at that. Oh wait, it doesn't have a numeric keypad. Ooh. All right, I'm gonna walk around and give everyone a nice pan and scan. I'm gonna do it live. Why not? All right, I'm gonna switch over to me for just a second, Wendell. <laughs> the Model M, huh? yes. It's such a satisfying sound. Well, you take the red or the blue pill. Probably both in the same uh, thing. My new mouse is the uh, Rocket uh, Tion mouse. Yeah. So, uh, hold on one second. I'm going to go show you guys. Zweihander, yeah. When I build my new computer, it'll be much better. All right, ready? I'm going to go do a pan and scan on my computer. Walking over there right now, guys. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough to do the whole David Attenborough thing. It's like, oh, you know. All right, Wendell, no one can see my screen, so you're going to have to do the closing salutations. Uh, okay, well, I guess we're out of here for this week. Uh, you guys should subscribe. Also, subscribe to the Linux and uh, the Linux and the Enterprise channel, if nothing else. And uh, the content's coming out there soon. We were gone for PDX, so... I didn't factor that in, but it's everything's basically done, so it's it's good. Uh, so we'll see you guys next week. Wait a second, you got to keep talking. I got I got to go figure out how to turn off this stupid stream. Remember, I always have those troubles on YouTube. <laughs> just pull right? the cable. Just pull the cable. Just, just got to pull the cable and run, and then I've I've got to go to the live <laughs> events, and then I've got to the live control room, and then I have to click on something to make it stop. So we're all just vamping now. All right, and um, yeah, that's the end. Bye, everybody. We'll see you in. See you. Uh, See if you can see me in here. See you guys in a couple of days.
stops 